Our scripture reading is in Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 7, with Othniel's story. We'll read through the end of the chapter, I believe, or close to it. Read through the end of the chapter. So, Judges chapter 3, starting in verse 7. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherahs. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel. So he sold them into the hands of Kushan Rishatham, king of Aram Naharim, uh, to whom the Israelites were subject for eight years. But when they cried out to the Lord, he raised them up a, for them a deliverer, Othniel, son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, who saved them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him so that he became Israel's judge and went to war. The Lord gave Cushan Rash- Rishathim, king of Aram, into the hands of Othniel, who overpowered him. So the, lands, so the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of Kenaz, died. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And because this, they did evil, this evil, the Lord gave them, gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took possession of the city of Psalms. The Israelites were subject to Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. Again, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, a left-handed man, the son of Jerah the Benjaminite. The Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Ehud made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab, who was a very fat man. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, leave us, and they all left. Ehud approached him while he was sitting on the throne in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. As the king rose from his seat, Ehud reached with his left hand, drew the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. Even the handle sank in, sank in after the blade, and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out, and the fat closed over it. Then Ehud went out on the porch. He shut the doors of the upper room behind him and locked them. After he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. They waited to the point of embarrassment. But when he did not open the doors of the room, they took the key and unlocked them. And there they saw their lord had fallen to the floor dead. While they waited, Ehud had got got away. He passed by the stone images and escaped to Sarai. And when he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him leading them. Follow me, he ordered, for the Lord has given Moab, your enemy, into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over. At that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all vigorous and strong. Not one escaped. That day, Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. After Ehud came, Shamgar, son of Anath, who struck down 6,000 Palestines with an ox goad. He, too, saved Israel. Sometimes, Scripture is very uplifting. My jest earlier aside, Scripture is often challenging. Even reading Paul's letters can leave us scratching our heads or making us feel uncomfortable. And in some ways, this is good. We shouldn't always come to Scripture and walk away feeling warm and comfortable. God has uncomfortable things to say. An example, one that we don't think about too much, is if we look to the New Testament, have you ever really paused to ponder and think about what it means for Jesus to have made a whip, flipped over the money changers' tables, and then drove people out with that whip. 
Oftentimes, when we think of Jesus, we think of Jesus as he's kind, he's full of grace and patience and generosity, but he was angry too and disappointed and heartbroken and sad. And that anger, I often think about that, that, that act that Jesus did, and I, I've, I've often pondered it, wondering, like, if it was Jesus, couldn't he have done it a different way? And I don't think there's a greater problem to tackle. There's, there's one of two. This is kind of included in the second one, but there's not really much of a greater challenge to tackle when it comes to us in modern-day Western culture than to tackle the question of what does it mean that God ordered the deaths of other people? What does it mean that God commanded Israel to march into Canaan and slaughter people, to destroy everything that they would have held dear as culture and as icons. To, as an example, it would be like if another country came in here and as they were moving through, they took the time to stop and destroy all of our football or sports posters and these different icons that we use as just part of our daily lives. Crosses or uh, images or paintings. If they just, just systematically destroyed all of those things. It's an erasure of culture. It removes these people effectively from existence, even if not every single one of them was killed. And this is a difficult topic to to tackle. What do we do in Judges where God routinely, at Israel's request, sends in a judge who always, always leads to war and death There's not a single exception. Every judge is responsible for the deaths of thousands of people. So we're going to talk about that today. I want to talk about the two stories we heard, give you some information and context for them. But then we're going to ask that question, what do we do with these so-called conquest narratives? That's the fancy term that we use for them, which is just the war stories. So when you read through Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, and you read these stories about how this king put these people to death and God ordered this prophet to tell a message to the king to march out or to not march out, what does this mean? And should it bother us? Hopefully, Lord willing, some of the things I say will bring some comfort. To be honest, even I'm not fully comforted by the things that I have to say. And so instead, I have to fall on faith and trust. So let's jump into the text. We have two stories that we read today. The beginning part of uh, chapter 3 of Judges is just a continued summary. I didn't read it last week. I didn't really want to read it this week. But I would encourage you, please read it in your free time. Uh, when you do your Bible study this week, please read all of Judges 1, 2, and all of Judges, especially as we're going through it. We're not going to cover every single verse in great detail because my goal is not to do a deep dive, but to give a summary to see what God wanted to do with these books. First story with Othniel. There's not a lot to say about it. It's very short and light on details. Israel did bad stuff. God sold them into captivity to another nation. They eventually said, ah, we don't like this. God, please forgive us and save us. So he raises up Othniel, which is Caleb's nephew. Caleb being one of the great champions with Joshua, who would have been instrumental in taking over the land of Canaan. And so Othniel leads a war, crushes his enemy, defeats them completely. But there's a couple of key phrases that I've always found interesting here that I want to draw your attention to. It's verse 7, the very first verse. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's a phrase you'll see all the time in the Old Testament. When it's referring to king, especially when they're introducing a king in the first Kings through Second Chronicles, it'll almost always start with such and such a king came to reign after such and such a king, and they either did evil or good in the eyes of the Lord. And I think that's crucial because one thing to remember, especially with the Old Testament, but it's just as true with the New, is that we're not talking about evil from our perspective. 
We're talking about evil from God's perspective. You see, Israelites doing evil in the eyes of the Lord means that the elders, the parents, the kids, every single one of them, as a community, is worshiping these other gods. They're worshiping the gods of fertility and the gods of war. They're worshiping these different gods, not God himself. And so this is evil, even if the Israelites themselves did not think so. The second interesting statement found here is that they forgot the Lord their God. To remember or to forget is always indicative of sin patterns showing up in a character's life in the pages of Scripture. They may not always say it, and I'm going to bring this up whenever it's relevant, but this is crucial. They forgot. What did they forget? Well, they forgot that their grandparents were enslaved to Egypt for 400 years, and God, through mighty acts, led them out of that captivity. They forgot that those same grandparents faltered at the edge of the land of Canaan, rather than trusting in God, they trusted in ten humans who said there's no way God cannot possibly lead us to take the land of Canaan. They forgot the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness where God weeded out that older generation and raised up the next one to be faithful, and they forgot their parents were faithful to God and marched through the land of Canaan. Well, Faithful to a point. If you read Joshua, you will see many times that even Joshua himself goes against the commands of God. But they were more faithful than the generation behind them. We should see improvement, progress. But this newest generation forgot. They forgot. They forgot everything. Everything that was behind them. Abandoning God. Abandoning the Lord who had served them and cared for them and protected them and instead served the gods of Canaan, whom God had just destroyed. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, in ancient history, when conflicts happened between nations, no one thought, well, the king of Damascus is going up against the king of Egypt, and they're fighting. No, the gods of Damascus are at war with the gods of Egypt. Those gods are fighting, and they're using us humans to carry out that battle. And whoever wins the battle on earth means that that god also won their battle in the heavens. This is how all ancient people would have thought about this. Now pause and think about that. God led Israel after battle after battle through unorthodox methods to prove over and over that which God was better? The God of Israel. It was the God of Israel. He was better. And yet, they're now serving the defeated gods that God crushed before them. That's how they should have rationalized it. But they forgot. And instead, they served the weaker gods, the gods they should have seen as weak. Another great story of this is in 1 Samuel Israel foolishly, before they have a king, they have a battle with the Philistines. And they take the Ark of the Covenant, thinking if we bring the Ark, God's seat, with us, well, that God is with us and we'll win. But they didn't win. They lost horribly. And the Philistines took the Ark to their capital and set the Ark before the statue of their god, Dagon. And it's supposed to show, the symbology there is that they have put the seat of the God of Israel at the feet of the God of Dagon. Showing that Dagon is superior. But what happens in the story? If you don't know, I'll tell you. Every morning when they woke up, Dagon's statue had fallen over and was face planted down before the Ark of the Covenant. Eventually, after they keep picking Dagon's statue up, They go, all right, this is getting too much. Just take the ark and just drop it off somewhere. Just get it out of the city. But that's how they viewed it. They viewed these battles not as between Philistine and Israel, but as between the God of Israel and Dagon. They were at war. And Dagon won. But now Dagon is bowing down to the God of Israel. What's happening? 
And so it's always really interesting to me in Othniel's story that Israel forgot and served the weaker gods. After this point, I can't keep track of the generations anymore because we're going 80 years, 50 years, 40 years. We're jumping ahead a lot. Basically, or roughly the life of the judge, Israel, post being saved, would be faithful. As we talked about two weeks ago, the cycle of judges. Just to recap, Israel enters into a time of sin where they're worshiping other gods, they're walking away, they've forgotten God. From there, God, in his anger, subjects them to captivity and harm from another nation. They, after some time, cry out to God asking for help and forgiveness. God, because he is merciful, kind, relents and sends a judge, a prophet, a leader to come and defeat this enemy nation that he himself set up to conquer Israel. Israel then, after being freed by this judge, would live for a time of peace and faithfulness, and then inevitably, worse than the time before, they would fall back into a pattern of sin and be evil in the eyes of God. And that's what we see from Ehud's story in verse 12. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Because they did this evil, the Lord gave them Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. So what happens here? We'll summarize it rather than reading it again. Eglon, super fat guy. Have you ever thought I was fat? We're talking. And fat in the ancient world was not how it means today. Nowadays, when you look at someone who's fat, I'm talking about myself, please. It's just me. You think lazy, slob, could do better, could work harder, drink less soda, things like that. My wife is listening right now. She's nodding her head right now. (laughs) In the ancient world, though, fat meant you were powerful and you had wealth because you had food. And you could eat as much as you wanted. Those peasants who are starving to death in a rail thin out in the countryside, well, they're starving because you're taxing the crap out of them and they barely have enough food to feed themselves. But you are king and you can eat as much as you desire. So Eglon, which should be seen as powerful and dominating as a king figure in this story. And yet Eglon, who's left-handed, is able to trick him. Now, if you've never heard this before, left-handed people were not trusted. In fact, it's not even that long ago in the 1900s where left-handed people were not that trusted. We've tried to force everyone to be right-handed. This is a recent change in our culture where we've moved away from that and being saying, oh, actually, left-handed, it's fine. Like, who cares? My wife is left-handed. She had to learn a lot of things right-handed anyways because most of us are right-handed. But in the ancient world, left-handed was bad because how else were you going to clean yourself after you went to the toilet? With your left hand. You don't shake with this hand. You don't do anything with this hand. Anyone who is left-handed is considered gross and untrustworthy. We don't like them. But Ehud was chosen by God to rescue the Israelites. And his left-handedness allowed him to create a deception. Because when you strap a sword on, you always put it on your opposite hip. Because you're going to reach across and then draw it out. So the opposite hip is his right thigh under his clothes. So if they were going to pat him down, why would they pat the right side? Everyone's right-handed. So they would check his left side, make sure he's not carrying weapons. There's nothing there. Okay, he's good. Ehud was able to deceive Eglon, kill him, and then leave, get Israel to come together, and then take over the crossing of the Jordan to prevent them from coming back. And the small battle took place. The Bible tells us that Ehud and his people managed to kill 10,000 Moabites. And there's something tragic about that because Moab should be the brother of Israel. There should be a kindness and a caring there, and there's not. Instead, there's death and pain. And then Shamgar gets a single verse. He was a guy who struck down 600 Philistines. We don't know anything about him other than he was a judge. These are the stories here. The stories of God telling about how he chose to rescue his people after he subjected them to punishment for their sin. So what about these Codquest narratives? This feels like a good time to talk about them because I don't know really when else to talk about them. Last week or two weeks ago, 
when we spoke, we talked about the need to remain faithful. That by forgetting God, they were not passing along the knowledge of God to the next generation. Thus, creating the cycle of sin, punishment, uh, repentance, rescue, sin again. This week, I really wanted to spend some time talking about the conquest narratives because it feels just like the best time. So what are the conquest narratives and what are the problems thereof? The conquest narratives, as I said earlier, are any time God orders his people to go and kill a bunch of other people. What is the problem with that? God is commanding humans to murder other humans, to kill them in battle, to end their lives, punish them swiftly. Most of us, myself included, probably can comfortably struggle with why that's a problem. Because we live in 2023, 2024. I'm not going to get used to that. It's going to take me a while. We live in 2024. The last time before Russia, the most recent time, that someone tried to do a huge conquest was 1939 and Hitler. Before that, it had been hundreds of years before we really saw an active war to conquer and take over another country. We live in a time of unprecedented peace. The world is not constantly at war today. I mean, there is. There's conflicts all the time, but we don't see it the way we used to see it. What do I mean by that? Even in the time of the kingdoms of Christendom, when it was like Britain and France and the Catholic Church reigned, what did they do? Invaded one another. Tried to take over each other's territory. Tried to create religious justification for these invasions. What about before them? Well, let's rewind all the way back to the time of Rome. Alexander the Great conquered most of that region, including Israel, huge swaths of it. And then Rome comes up from Italy and takes most of that land over themselves. And if we keep going back in time, this is just a continued pattern through human history. We live at a time where that just doesn't happen the way it used to. There's civil wars, there's genocides, there are other things like that that are happening around the world. Absolutely. But... America is not drafting our young men and women to go into service because we want to conquer Canada or Mexico. England is no longer sending their troops across the straits into Normandy and France. This doesn't happen anymore. And so since we are so far removed from this world, it's hard sometimes as modern people to wrap our minds around what is happening. Because I'll be honest, I'll say it what, what I think. When I read these stories, I really struggle to understand why God would order his people to kill other people. So there are three things that I want to bring to you. I could have given you up to 20. But there are three things that I want to share with you why I think these conquest narratives are not a problem and should not bother us a lot. There are more... No Bible scholar agrees on all of them. And so this is a big debate over how we approach it. But these are the three I found the most persuasive, that I found the most comforting. The first one is that morality has changed. You see, a long time ago, as we were just talking about, the, cop, the, uh, the thought process of getting your troops together and taking over a neighboring country, well, that was normal. That was what you did. Like, of course. You take over land and property. Israel, in ancient times, was a highway. Two major highways would lead from the northern regions in Damascus, where Assyria would eventually end up, and you could either go down one side of the Jordan River into Egypt, or down the other side of the Jordan River into modern-day, um, the, that peninsula down there. I don't know, I'm blanking on the country's name. Um, <clears throat> those are the highway roads. Israel was a highway. Well, what happens if you can control a highway? You can control taxes and tariffs. Oh, you're a merchant from Egypt? Well, we from Damascus control this road. So if you want to enter here, you're going to have to pay a pretty penny. Or perhaps they can stranglehold supplies going to a nation they're at war with. If you're Damascus and you want to defeat Egypt, maybe you prevent merchants from going through. Say, oh, sorry, your goods, drop them off here, go back home. They're ours now. 
Israel was always being fought over because if you could control highway, you could control money, you could control war, you could control the movement of people. You had so much power. So, of course, Israel knew they were going to constantly be invaded. Hence why God always said, trust me and be strong and courageous. Called them to be faithful because God always planned on protecting them. Whereas nowadays, we don't use war. We tend to use other political pressures, such as tariffs or embargoes, preventing the trading goods or increasing the prices on those goods to put pressure on other countries. That's still pressure. Still, I would say maybe not good, but it's not killing people directly. I don't know if it's killing people or not. I'm not smart enough to know these things. I'm not a politician after all. Thank the Lord. But morality has changed in other ways too. As we've moved forward, we have adopted a new way of thinking. Modernity changed the way we approach the world. And we left behind a communal thought process where none of you ever would have thought, well, I need to do something for myself. You would have thought, well, we need to do something for ourselves. You would have always thought in communal thought processes. That's not the case anymore. Even for me, I understand this conceptually. And really intimately, when I read the Bible, it is a communal book written to a communal people. It was not about you individually change your life. It was about you as a community change your behavior. But even I read the commands from Paul in the New Testament, and I go, okay, so Michael Hall needs to change. Not Trowbridge Community Church needs to change. That's just because the way we think about the world has changed. Is that good? Is that bad? I have no idea. No one knows. And you'll hear people try and argue from one side or the other. I don't think we can really know. But we have changed the way we think about the world and how we engage with it. The world has just changed. As we've moved forward, as new thoughts come up, we've just adapted to those thoughts and brought them in. We don't think the way the Bible thinks. We don't write the way the Bible writes. And that's okay. God's word is still timeless. It just requires more work on our part to properly understand what God wanted to have said and then move that forward into what it means for us today. So that's the first point. Morality has changed. How we view war and conflict has changed from ancient times to now. The second point that I want to bring up, and this one is a little shakier, but I think it's still important to understand is a lot of the conquest narratives in the Old Testament were done for Israel's purity. Think about it. God's plan for Joshua in the book of Joshua was that he would lead the people to expel or destroy every single people group in, land of, in the land of Israel. And they did not do it. They destroyed some. They made treaties in pacts and truces with others. And some others, they just said, eh, I don't need to settle there. I'll settle somewhere else. And because of that... These cultures' influence got into Israel and led them to begin to worship other gods, to practice other things. There's a judge in a couple of chapters, Jephthah. He's not the biggest screw up, but he is on the list. He sacrifices his own daughter because he's an idiot who made a foolish promise to sacrifice the first thing that comes out of his front door after he wins the battle. Where would that idea have come from? Child sacrifice was never in the law that God provided. But it was in Canaan. Sacrificing a child or another human to a God was something that you did in the land of Canaan. And by not destroying them and removing them from the land, Israel's purity was tainted and strange ideas crept in and got blended into the understanding that Israel was supposed to have about themselves. So, the morality changed. How we view these wars has changed. Which is important just to remember that we just view them differently than how they did. The conquest narratives are for Israel's purity. That's the second thing. And the third thing, sin leads to death. I don't, I, this is the one that really got me that I spent the most time thinking about. Who in this room deserves to be alive? 
Theologically speaking, none of us. Every person in this room, I can say with confidence, has sinned. And every single person I can say with confidence in this room deserves the wrath of God. And I can say with confidence that every single person in this room, if you have put your faith in Christ, will never experience either. Death, physically, but not spiritually. And someday you will be restored into how God always intended for us to be. But death is coming for everyone else who has not placed their faith in Christ. Think about it. We worship a God who we comfortably believe is going to send to hell for eternity everyone who does not put their faith in Christ. In a lot of ways, the conquest narratives are tame in comparison. There was sin in those countries. Sin that God could not tolerate anymore. In fact, the Bible tells us that the reason God waited the length of time that he did with Israel suffering in captivity was because the sin of the Canaanites had not been fulfilled, had not been completed. He had had patience and tolerance up to a point. And then he freed Israel, led them through Canaan to punish them, to destroy sin. Isn't it a blessing that we live on this side of the cross. Where now, instead of killing us and destroying us regularly as being God's response to sin, and now instead he calls you and I to challenge one another, to challenge the world around us, to reach a loving hand out to our neighbor, our family member, our friend, to say, hey, you know, there's a God who wants to love you instead of hate you. There's a God who wants to cherish you and care for you and lead you into health and safety. Every breath that I breathe is undeserved. Every time I feel joy in my heart because my son or my daughter do something adorable is a feeling I should not be allowed to have. Because I have sinned. I have spat in the face of God's love and kindness. I am without excuse. And yet, God chose instead to say, but I'm going to give you one. And it's not an excuse, it's an explanation. Why am I not dead? Because God's mercy is, un, is unattainable and I can't understand it. Why did Christ die for our sins? I couldn't tell you, other than that God loves us. And God just couldn't leave it as it is. Why? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. The only thing the Bible tells us is that God loves us. And he chose to save us. Because he wanted to. Because he felt like it. Because it brought him joy. So when we look to the Old Testament in these conquest narratives, and we read these stories about how Ehud killed Eglon, or how Othniel killed a bunch of people from Aram and Kushan, we should not... I don't think that we should pause and say, God, why would you do something so horrible? Instead, I think what we should say is, God, thank you for allowing me to live in a time where I don't have to experience that. And then pray that places like Russia would stop what they're doing. That these countries like China, who are eyeballing some of your neighbors, that the evils in, exhibited against one another, all these different stories, the war in Gaza with Palestine and Israel, all of it, pray that it would just stop that people could find in their hearts to forgive, that they could be turned from their sin and put their faith in Christ. That's what we should be praying for. Because we live on this side of the cross. We get to choose mercy. We don't have to kill people because they're apostates or they're speaking some heresy. Instead, we can just condemn them with our words and ask them to think about it again. Try again. We think that's wrong. It's a bad belief. We don't have to kill them for it. So when you approach these conquest narratives, and if you become uncomfortable, I just ask you, do you trust God to know what he is doing? Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
And then from Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 19, one of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us? For who is able to resist his will? Paul's talking about how God has led, shown mercy on some and compassion on some, but not on others. So we say, then why does God judge us and blame us? And his response, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me this like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Basically, God's will is, uh, is something that we cannot fully grasp or understand. However, we should take a page out of Abraham's book. And we should approach God boldly and say, God, instead of killing Sodom and Gomorrah, could you have mercy? Instead of punishing these people, could you have mercy and bring them instead to your house and bring them into your family? Lord, could your mercy continue to reign over these people who have done something harmful to myself? Will you help me to forgive them as you want to forgive them? It's strange to think about, but we have to remember we are a creature, not the creator. We cannot fully understand God's ways, but we know, we should know, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that God is good, that God is love, and above all else, God desires forgiveness and mercy, but that sin would be eradicated and destroyed forever. So if we don't want to see that happen in the lives of the people around us, then we should do everything within our power, on our hands and knees in prayer, through outreach, through building relationships with them, to show them that there's something different in life. Thank God he doesn't command us to take up the sword and march to Allegan. Instead, he asks us to take up the word and go to our neighbor's have a cup of tea and maybe a meal. Just ask them how they're doing. What's their life like? Can I tell you about Jesus? That's the war we fight now. Not against one another, but against sin and evil itself. So as we read through Judges, just remember, God is still a God of love, even though he has to destroy people because sin cannot exist forever. It must be dealt with. And so let's be faithful and deal with sin in our own lives, in our community, and then encourage our neighbors and our friends to deal with it themselves. Let's be faithful so that the generations coming after us will know a better lesson than ours do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, just pray that you would comfort our hearts. Lord, your word is troubling at times. It's difficult doesn't make sense. But God, I know that you, you still love us and you still desire to see mercy as well as uh, your wrath fulfilled. And so Lord, may we be agents of mercy. May we be people you use to show your mercy to others. May people experience your grace through our lives. Lord, we ask that you would hold off your wrath. That instead, your son, who has already borne all of it, would continue to do so for the sake of our friends, our family, and our neighbors. We ask that when sin crops up in our own lives, that you would destroy it. Remove it, however you have to, no matter how difficult or uncomfortable it makes us. Lord, may your mercy on us mean the destruction of sin in our lives. May our arrogance, our pride, our wickedness, our jealousy be destroyed from our hearts forever. May we faithfully and humbly serve you. Comfort our hearts, Lord. You have already won the battle. and Your Son is working on making us whole anew. And richly fill us with hope that there is a better future waiting for us. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you so much, God.
Father, it is in your Son's name, through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we ask these things. Amen.